जाए शीशी पंच तत्व की जाए शीशी राधा माधव की जाए शीशी राधा मदान मोहन की जाए शान पंचमी की जाए शिव बाबू पान की जाए जय राधा कुंज स्वयं रूपा कदम मयम ददाती स्वयं पदाती कम 
Nama Om Vishnu Padaya Krishna Prasthaya Bhutale Shri Makti Bhakti Vedanta Swami Iti Namine Namaste Saraswati Deve Horavani Pacharine Nirvisesa Sunyavadi Asyatyade Satarine Pancha Kalpa Tarubhisya Kripa Sindhu Vebhacha Patitanam Pavane Pyo Vaishnave Pyo Namaho Namaha Shri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Shri Advaita Gadadara Srivasati Gaur Bhakta Vrinda Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare Shri Panchatattva Ki Jai Shri Prabhupada Ki Jai so um, this day is a really auspicious day. It's a celebration day, especially in the land of India. It's known as Vasant Panchami, which heralds or introduces the first day of spring. So around the world, and today I was taking darshan of many deities around the world. The deities are dressed in yellow, <laughs> and sometimes a mixture of yellow and green. We saw some, we saw Madhava, Radha, Madhava, and uh, Radha, Shwasisi, Radha Landanishwara, and also Sri Radha Maran from, uh, from Vrindavan, all dressed in beautiful yellow, sometimes combination yellow and light green is the colors for today's deity dressing. Of course, because we dress here once a week, um, we got a little yellow in there. <laughs> More like golden yellow. <laughs> but uh, that is, uh, that's the tradition. And remember, welcomes the first day of spring. And it's one of the interesting days in terms of honoring the Acharyas. There are, there are at least five celebrations that go on today. Saraswati Puja. Um, the Appearance Day of Vishnu Priya, the wife of Lord Chaitanya, the Appearance Day of Raghunath Das Goswami, the Appearance Day of Pundarik Vidyanidhi, the Appearance Day of Raghunandana Thakur, and the Disappearance Day of Srila Vishwanath Chakravarti Thakur. So all are celebrated on this day. Um, and of course I have received a request from an anonymous person who said I should s mention something about Tamal Krishna Goswami's sannyas, which he took on this day um, in 1972, was the actual day he took sannyas. Um, it's interesting, in the year 2002, which was 30 years later, we were together, myself, Tamal Krishna Goswami, Krishna Shetra Maharaj, who was then Krishna Shetra Brahmachari, um, Gauri, the temple president of Bhaktivedanta Manor, and Kripa Maya Prabhu. And the five of us, or four, yeah, five of us, we all spoke on that day on one of these uh, personalities. And uh, Tamal Krishna Goswami was the last one to speak, and he spoke in length about his sannyas, which was at that time, 2002, February, was February 12th, I believe, 2002, uh, which was, um, of course, the same celebration day, but it was his 30 years of having received a sannyas initiation. Unfortunately, I had that recorded, and uh, I have it somewhere on my computer. I tried to open it up today, but I just kept getting no, no go, Joe. <laughs> it wasn't go. I couldn't open it up for some reason. It was a CD that we had copied onto, onto a hard drive. So I wasn't able to hear the details of his sannyas, but he did speak about it then. And um, I remember, uh, of course, on that day, the first speaker was um, was uh, Krishna Shetra Prabhu, at that time Maharaj. 
and he spoke on Sarasvati Puja. I spoke on Vishnu Priya, and uh, I think Gauri Das Pandit, Gauri Prabhu, he spoke on um, on uh, Pundrik Vidyanidhi, and uh, someone spoke uh, on Gor. Uh, uh, what was his name? Kripa Maya Prabhu. I think he spoke on Raghunandana, and also on on. Um, uh, not Vishnu, the Raghunath Das Goswami. But uh, the last, in that class, we started at 7.30 in the morning. At 9 o'clock, we broke for breakfast. We all took breakfast with all the speakers. And Tamal Krishna Goswami was there, serving out the prasadam to the devotees. And then everybody reconvened after breakfast for the remainder of this program, and we went all the way up through the almost to lunchtime. <laughs> so it was a very interesting morning, and uh, and then of course Maharaj spoke about his sannyas, which was something that for him really was meaningful because he had asked his divine grace Srila Prabhupada if he could take sannyas. And at the time he was married, and he had a very wonderful wife. I can't remember her name. But when she found out that her husband wanted to take sannyas, she went to Prabhupada and told Prabhupada, you know, don't give him sannyas. <laughs> so, because it says, and this is also a principle, that you can't, if you're married, and if you want to take sannyas, you have to get the permission of your wife before you can do it. <laughs> Otherwise, so she didn't give permission. <laughs> and Prabhupada was concerned because, um, you know, the marriage was nice, there wasn't anything wrong, but he just wanted to take sannyas <laughs> because he felt that he could really preach uh, more effectively and more regularly. So that's why he approached Srila Prabhupada. So Prabhupada presented what his wife had said and basically didn't agree. <laughs> but those of you who know Tamal Krishna Goswami, when he wants something, he gets it. <laughs> and so he was determined. And finally, at one point, Prabhupada threw up his arms and said, what can I do? <laughs> okay, so... He, he gave him that sannyas, and that was on that day, which is today the anniversary of Vansad Fasad Panchami. And of course, when he received his sannyas, he excelled in preaching and did many amazing things to bring some of the more important projects successfully completed, such as getting the land in Mayapur. It was to all Krishna Goswami that worked really hard and got the land in Mayapur. Also, when the Krishna books came into India, they got stuck in the Bombay immigration docks and the, nobody would release the books. And everyone who tried failed and finally Tamal Krishna Goswami was successful in getting the books released. And that was just a few of his uh, achievements. Um, he had an unbi uncanny ability to get things done. If Prabhupada needed some, Prabhupada tried to get things done through a lot of devotees, and when it failed, he went to Tamal. <laughs> and when he went to Tamal, he knew he could get it done, because Tamal had that ability to get things done. He knew how to do it. And he was f f focused on, on pleasing Srila Prabhupada. So. Um, I could give a whole class on Tamal Krishna Goswami, but I don't think that's the main topic tonight. Although today is the anniversary, and we're remembering him for all the wonderful service he's done to Srila Prabhupada's movement, especially the Mayapur land, which was really something Prabhupada wanted, and Prabhupada could not get it going through the normal procedures. Only when Tamal Krishna Goswami worked tirelessly, I mean, he gave up sleep. He didn't even sleep. He was working through the night 
until he got that land. And that's how determined he was to, to, to get it, and he got it. <laughs> and when he got it, Prabhupada was so happy. <laughs> oh, he was so happy. Um, and so, well, we honor, of course, this departed Vaishnava, who was one of the intimate, intimate disciples of Srila Prabhupada, a right-hand man, a person who who started preaching in America in a very big way with the Radha Damodar party, traveling all over America and bringing uh, brahmacharis onto his program and they were distributing books and holding Harinams all over America. And that's really how the, the uh, temples grew in America. They would go to college campuses and they would hold programs on college campuses and then immediately people write right there, sometimes would join, just coming. They had their bus, and they would bring people on the bus, and the next minute the guy was shaved up with a ponytail, and he was a devotee. So uh, at one point, well, Prabhupada wanted Tamal Krishna to go to India, because he needed somebody to work out the problems in India. Prabhupada was having problems in Bombay especially. So he told, he ordered Tamal Krishna Goswami to go to India and do the work, and Tamal didn't want to go. <laughs> and so Prabhupada was strict, you, you have to go, you're the only one who can help with the project there, we're having so many problems. But Tamal Krishna came up with an idea to convince Prabhupada otherwise. <laughs> So one time after preaching, uh, Prabhupada was there and Tamal Krishna came in. And right behind Tamal Krishna was 10 brand new devotees who had just joined the Tamal Krishna's Goswami's traveling party. They were all shaved up nicely in their, in their robes. And one by one, they came up to Srila Prabhupada and gave Srila Prabhupada a flower. This was all organized by Tamal Krishna Goswami. And there was 10 of them. They all had become new devotees within a few days. So he thought, okay, when Prabhupada sees what we're doing here, then he won't send me to India. <laughs> so after Prabhupada saw these 10 boys who were smiling, handing flowers to Prabhupada, Prabhupada, all right, you can stay here and preach. <laughs> Because that's what Prabhupada wanted. He wanted to see more and more devotees joining our movement. And Tamal Krishna Goswami on that. They were amazing. They were going to colleges and making devotees left and right. And the movement really expanded. That was in the years 1973, 74, around that time. So it has many wonderful stories about him and... Uh, uh, if someday, if the devotees would like, I can give a whole class on uh, Tamal Krishna Goswami's, you know, qualities, his achievements, his abilities, so many things that he did to help expand Krishna consciousness. He was really a very powerful devotee. Really extremely powerful and extremely strict in his sadhana. His sadhana was like very strong. <clears throat> so today I'll mention some of the personalities who are honored today. Um, we did mention today is the Saraswati Puja. I don't have much information on that. Uh, Krishna Shetra Maharaj is an expert in that area. <laughs> So you could ask him more about that. <clears throat> but uh, one thing we know, and one thing that people don't know, is not the Saraswati that is the wife of Lord Brahma, because Brahma's consort is Saraswati Devi, who is the goddess of transcendent, goddess of knowledge. And but this is not the same Saraswati. There's another Saraswati who is the expansion of of uh, Lakshmi Devi. So this Saraswati who we honor is, an, is Lakshmi Devi in her expansion as Saraswati. 
as Lakshmi expands herself into nine different form, eight different forms of herself in order to serve Lord Narayan in different ways. So one of them is Saraswati. And this is the personality who we honor on this particular day. And there's many, there's actually pastimes related to that. <clears throat> Today is also the um, appearance of Vishnu Priya. Vishnu Priya was the wife of Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. When Lord Chaitanya took sannyas, she was only 16 years old. And at that time, of course, Lord Chaitanya left his wife, he left his mother, and he went to, before he went to Jagannath Puri to, uh, to uh, practice his, in mood of sannyasi, he stayed at the house of Advaita Charya for about three months. <clears throat> During that time, Sachimati came to see her son, Lord Chaitanya, and there at that time, before he actually left Advaita Charya's house, he actually, the Lord wanted to go to Vrindavan and preach and stay in Vrindavan, but Sachimata dissuaded him, saying that actually, if you go to Vrindavan, we will never see you again, we will never hear of you again. This is too much for us. So she, she pleaded that with Lord Chaitanya to please go to Jagannath Puri instead and make that your resident. And then the Lord agreed, and she said that Jagannath Puri and Navadweep are two rooms in the same house, so we will have a chance to see you. <clears throat> so out of love for his mother, the Lord agreed to go to Jagannath Puri instead of Vrindavan. But at that time, he broke all his connection with his wife, Vishnu Priya, who was really young. And she stayed alone. She lived another 80 years. She lived to the age of 96. She was 16 when she, he left. And after he left, <clears throat> she went into kind of a solitude. She practically didn't see the sun. She stayed inside. And she would chant the holy names of the Lord the whole day. And every time she would chant one round, she would take a grain of rice and put it on the side. And then at the end of the day, whatever grains were there, she would cook that, and that's what she would eat on that day. And she followed that austerity the rest of her life. <clears throat> she stayed with Sachimata, because Sachimata was also alone, so they stayed together. And then there was one assistant called Ishana, who would help both of them in services. Uh, Sachimata, I mean, <coughs> excuse me, Vishnu Priya, um, said to her husband, Lord Chaitanya, that you're going and I'll never see you again. Please give me something to remember you by. So the Lord wanted to show his affection for his wife. So he went to one of his followers, whose name was Vamsidari, and said, you carve a deity of me. And then he posed for that deity, and that deity was carved. And uh, that deity is still there in Navadweep area, in the place called Koladweep. And it's called <clears throat> uh, Dameshwar Mahadev. And you can see that beautiful deity. He's smiling. He's got his arms like this, straight out. It's a rare pose. Usually, but most of the time we see Lord Chaitanya like this or like this. When he's like this, he's dancing. When he's like this, he's dancing in ecstasy. <laughs> and when he's like this, full mercy, complete Complete mercy like that. So that deity, that deity was given to Vishnu Priya and she worshipped that deity her whole life like that. And she was and that way, because that deity was none different than Lord Chaitanya's. So she felt happy having the opportunity to serve the Lord in his deity form. But being very strict in his sannyas, he never associated again with his wife, although he did see his mother occasionally when she would come to Jagannath Puri. <clears throat> um, 
Vishnu Priya, prior to Lord Chaitanya's leaving, was the perfect wife. Very simple, very chaste, and very obedient. Lord Chaitanya many times would bring his followers, his associates, to the house for lunch. And she would always be ready to cook nice, big meals for the devotees that when they come. And sometimes Lord Chaitanya would bring 20 people for lunch. <laughs> And she would be able to feed them all very nicely and satisfy them. So she was always uh, obedient and very, very uh, dutiful in her services to her husband, like that. But Lord Chaitanya's mission was to preach Krishna consciousness, and he felt that uh, I can reach so many people I can't reach by taking the sannyas order. And of course, that was the Mayavadis especially. He knew that he, in order to affect or, or to reach the Mayavadis, he had to be a, a Mayavadi sannyasi. That's why he took Mayavad sannyasi, so he could transform Prakasananda Saraswati along with his 60,000 followers, which he converted in Banaris to, to Vaishnavas. So Lord Chaitanya always empowered his devotees accordingly to preach to different types of people. He, he empowered Lord Nityananda to preach to the Grihastas. Lord Nityananda was an Abhaduta. He's called Abhaduta. <laughs> it's one of his names. And therefore he had no connection with anything in material. But Lord Chaitanya told him, get married. <laughs> and that way you can preach to that group of people. And so he did obey the orders of Lord Chaitanya and, receive, and accepted two wives, Janaba Devi and Visuddha, and had two children, Birabhadra and Ganga Devi from Visuddha. So that was, uh, that was Lord Nityananda did that in order to please Lord Chaitanya and help preach to the Grihastas. Because Lord Chaitanya's whole mission was to spread the Sankirtan as much as he could all over India. And he did. From the top to the bottom, he affected the whole subcontinent with the Harinam Sankirtan movement. And then we have um, Pundarik Vidyanidhi. Pundarik Vidyanidhi is an incarnation of the of Vrishubhanu Devi. Vishubhanu, King Vishubhanu, who was the uh, father of Radharani, Srimati Radharani. Now he appeared as Pundarik Vidyanidhi in Gaur, Gauranga Mahaprabhu's pastimes. He was different. He wasn't simple like the rest of the devotees, because all of Lord Chaitanya's devotees were quite renounced. Mahaprabhu Bhakta Vanir Vairagya Pradhan. So the followers of Lord Chaitanya are in the mood of re renunciation. That's what that verse means. They, they consider renunciation their life and soul. So therefore they're not interested in anything worldly at all. But Pundarik Vidyanidhi was a little different. He liked to dress really gorgeously. <laughs> and he would wear silken garments with flower garlands. He would chew red color betel nut, so his teeth would be red. <laughs> he would put on makeup, and he would put nice fragrant oils in his hair to smell very nicely. And, and so, um, but he was a great devotee. <laughs> But you couldn't tell by looking at him. <laughs> so one time when he had come to Navadweep, Lord Chaitanya immediately understood he had arrived. So he wanted to uh, give Gadadhar Pandit, the Gadadhar Pandit from the Panchatattva, a little bit of instructions. So he said to Gadadhar Pandit, you should go and meet Pundarik Vidyanidhi. And so he arranged for Mukunda to take uh, Gadadhar Pandit to Pundarik Vidyanidhi. 
And so they went, and they went to the place of Pundarik Vidyanidhi, which was not only was he dressed opulent, but his, his quarters were nice bedsteads and nice draperies, flower pots, everything that is opulent. And he had six servants who would come and fan him. They would, they would fan him. <laughs> and so he looked like a, you know, a visayi. <laughs> he looked like a worldly person. And so when he came, when Mukunda came, they came, and Gadadhar, when Gadadhar saw Pundarik Vidyaniti, he was thinking, this is a great devotee. He looks like a, you know, a sense gratifier. <laughs> so, but he didn't say it. He was just thinking that in his mind. But Mukunda could understand what Gadadhar was feeling. So he decided to do something. So Mukunda, he got one verse from the Srimad Bhagavatam, third canto, second chapter, verse number 23. Do we have, can somebody put that up on the board real fast? Or do we have 3223? Three, this is the verse that was chanted by, um, by Mukunda when he understood the um, mind of a Gadadhar Pandit. Will it take a while to do this? One minute. One minute? Okay. So this verse um, is an interesting verse. It's spoken by Vidura in this context, but it's a pastime of Krishna when he was just a little baby in Vrindavan. And this verse illustrates that pastimes. 3.23. It's worth waiting for, I think. We're getting a lot of colors, but that's all. And it looks like this thing hasn't worked in a long time. <laughs> uh, maybe uh, somebody can use their phone and we can pull it up real fast or looks like we're going to take too long to get this up do you have the Veda base Mataji 3 2 23 and this verse was chanted very sweetly by Mukunda. The only thing is, only if you have it on the phone, only one person can see it. Okay. Welcome to today's modern technology. Do we get a commercial first before we? No. <laughs> Beta base, okay, three, third canto. There it is, third canto. We're getting close. Okay, chapter two, verse 23. Okay, here we go. Don't we have we don't have the Sanskrit, do we? Oh yes we do. Okay. Aho bakiyam stanastala kutam jigasam sadyapaya yad api asadvi lege leve gatim datri uchitam tato nyam kamvai dalalum saranam vajema. This is what he chanted loudly in the presence of uh, Pundarik. Alas, how shall I take shelter of one more merciful than he who granted the position of mother to a she-demon, Putana, although she was un unfaithful and she prepared deadly poison to be sucked from her breath. So he chanted that verse. And when Pundarik Vidyanidhi heard that verse, 
he went mad, literally mad. He went into ecstasy, thinking, how merciful is the Lord that this demon witch, she came with ill reasons to try to kill him, and she offered a breast milk filled with poison, and Krishna accepted her service and gave her liberation after killing her, of course. He gave her liberation on the same level of his mother. So when Pundarik Vidyanidhi heard that, he went mad, literally mad. He just started tearing off his clothes and throwing things around. He was breaking everything in the apartment. He was rolling on the ground. He kept chanting this verse over and over enough, glorifying Lord Sri Krishna. And, and his servants, they came to hold him down, and they couldn't. He was just so wild in ecstasy. And this went on for six hours, as described, for six full hours. Gadadhar Pandit was shocked <laughs> when he saw, he, then he could understand, oh my God, I committed a great offense by thinking this person was ordinary. He's actually a very, very advanced devotee. So after feeling like that, and of course after six hours, Pundarik Vidyanidhi came out of his trance, he was in trance of consciousness in ecstasy. He realized what he did and he felt embarrassed. But then Bakunda said that actually Gadadhar Pandit, he wants to take initiation for you. Because Gadadhar Pandit, after realizing how, what he was thinking in the wrong way, he said, I have to do something to make up for my offense. It was no offense because it was in the mind, but he was thinking like that. And so he decided, let me become his disciple. So when, he, when that was communicated to Pundarik Vidyanidhi, Pundarik Vidyanidhi said, yes, it is a great fortune in one's life to receive a disciple like Gadadhar Pandit. <laughs> and it's interesting because, as you know, Pundarik Vidyanidhi was King Vrishabhanu, and Gadadhar Pandit is Srimati Radharani. <laughs> so father and daughter have become reunited as guru and disciple. So that was Lord Chaitanya's plan <laughs> to give the mercy to uh, Gadadhar Pandit. <clears throat> so that's one beautiful pastime. Lord Chaitanya would call Pundarik Vidyanada media, he would call him father. Oh, my father, oh, my father. Because he was also in the mood of Srimati Radharani. And then we have Raghunandana Thakur. Raghunandana Thakur was the son of Mukunda, Sarakeli, whose brother was Suryadas Sarakeli, whose daughter was Janavi Devi. So he was the nephew of Suradas Surakeli, and his father Mukunda was a physician. And uh, he was a young boy, and his father went to work one day, and he, he said to his wife, we should teach our son to worship our deity. So today, you, you give him all the instructions, I have to leave for work. So she did, the deity was a, a Krishna deity of Gopinath, so the boy was only five years old. So his mother instructed him, here, you take this glass of warm milk and this ladu, you bring it to Gopinath, you put it in front of Gopinath, you sit down, you ring the bell, you chant this mantra, and then you ask Gopinath, please come take your food. So the boy knew everything. He took the tray in, put it in front of Gopinath, sat down, rang the bell, chanted the mantra, and then he asked Gopinath, please take your food. But the boy was thinking, Gopinath's not eating, what's wrong? Because, <laughs> you know, Krishna, it's mentioned in the Brahma Samhita, angani yasya sakalendri viti manti pasyanti panti kalyan jananti. 
that all of the different senses of the Lord are interchangeable. So the Lord can eat with his eyes, just like sometimes atheists, they think you're offering food to these idols. But what is that? They're not eating. The food is still there. It's because you can't see, that's why. <laughs> but the devotees know when you offer with love and devotion, Krishna accepts, he eats, he says, asnami, asnami, I eat. But he's accepting the bhakti along with the food, but he does, he eats. So but the little uh, Raghunandana, he couldn't understand that, so he started to cry. Gopina, you're not eating, you're not eating. My mother will become un unhappy because I'm supposed to feed you and you're not eating. And so he's crying. Finally, Gopinath spoke to him and said, I'm eating, but I don't eat like you. <laughs> no, no, you must eat. And so he kept crying. So Gopinath decided to please his devotee. So he drank all the milk, the deity, and ate the ladu, everything. And the boy came out, and there's nothing on the tray. <laughs> his mother asked, well, where's the prashadam? Well, he ate it. <laughs> Isn't that what was supposed to happen? <laughs> so she wasn't sure what to do, so she thought, I'll just wait for his father to come home. So when Mukunda came home, she told him, and he was curious. And then he asked his son, and he said, yes, he ate. He didn't want to eat at first, but then I start crying, and then he ate. <laughs> So his father didn't know what to think. <laughs> so the next day he thought, "I'm gonna, we'll, give, we'll, we'll do, we'll do, we'll do the same thing again. We'll give him the boga, and this time I'll hide." So Mukunda hid so he could watch everything. And when his son brought it in, he did the same thing and rang the bell. And this time Gopinath drank half the milk and ate half the ladu. I think that half ladu was still somewhere. I think they kept it <laughs> permanently. <laughs> it said somewhere in India. Um, yeah. So when Mukunda saw that, then he could understand that his son was a great devotee of the Lord. <clears throat> and so later on, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu was with Mukunda. Yeah, he said, hey, Mukunda. Magunda, who's the father and who's the son? Raghunanda is your son and you're his father, but who's the father and who's the son? <laughs> and then Magunda said, yes, my lord. Raghunanda, Raghunanda he's my father and, and I'm his son. Because <laughs> it's understood that the son learns from the father. So I'm learning from my son. So he was such a great devotee. And then there was another devotee called uh, uh, Abhiram Saka, who was an incarnation of Sridham in Krishna's pastime. And he had a whip. It was called Jai Mangala. And if he hit you with the whip, you get love of God <laughs> automatically. <laughs> but not, not too many people would get that mercy. So Abhiram, <clears throat> he heard what happened with, with Raghunandana, so he wanted to come and see him. And another thing is about Abhiram, he was very powerful. And if he paid obeisances to a, to a, a shaligram, and if it wasn't a real shaligram, because sometimes people would get a black rock and say this was shaligram, but it wasn't that rock would crack. If, there, if it wasn't a real shalagram, as soon as he paid obeisances, the rock would crack and break. That was, that was Abhiram. And he had another thing, that if he paid obeisances to you, and if you weren't a pure devotee, you would die immediately. Haribo. <laughs> So he wanted to come and meet Raghunandana. So his parents were shocked. Oh my God, Abhiram's come to see our son. 
if he pays obeisances to our son, he'll die. <laughs> and so they were scared, so they hid him in another village. So he, when Abhiram come, came, but Abhiram was really, I mean, he was a mystic. He was just really powerful. He could understand where Raghunandana was. So he went right to that village and found Raghunandana. And as soon as he saw him, he paid his obeisance to him. And he didn't die. Because <laughs> he was a pure devotee. <laughs> like that. So, yeah, this was Raghunanda Thakur. And he was there during the Ketri Gram festival when, when um, <clears throat> Naratam Das Thakur was performing kirtan. During that kirtan, this was 50 years after Lord Chaitanya had left the planet. Uh, during that kirtan, Lord Chaitanya and all the Panchatattva, along with many of the devotees who had already left the planet, they all returned in that kirtan. And at that time, Raghunanda Thakur was there at that kirtan to see his father Mukunda return with Lord Chaitanya. Now this is a little bit about Raghunandana. And then we have Srila Haridas Thakur, I mean, uh, um, Raghunath Das Goswami. I think we spoke at length a couple months ago on the disappearance, which was in the month of Kartik, of Raghunath uh, Das Goswami. I'll just mention <clears throat> that <clears throat> his austerities were like lines in a rock. So if you see markings in the rock, you can't, you can't erase it. Because it's a rock. It's, it's really in there. So his austerity every day was to offer 2,000 obeisances to the Lord, to the Lord <clears throat> and 1,000 obeisances to the Vaishnavas. This is what he would do every day. And he followed that strictly and says that his austerities were like lines in the rock. Of course, we know he came from a very wealthy family. His father and his uncle were uh, employers of the king, and they were compared to billionaires today. They were so wealthy. And so he grew up as the only son in that family. He could have inherited all that and, of course, he had a beautiful wife who was described at her. She was so beautiful. She was like an angel from the heavenly planets. So chaste, so faithful, beautiful, obedient. But he gave all that up. He had no interest in anything. He only wanted to join Lord Chaitanya. So when he did, of course, after some time, he kept trying to sneak away. His parents would try to tie him down, and they put 11 guards around him to keep him from going. And then his mother said, we should take him and tie him up with ropes, and that way it will keep him from going. His father said, what will ropes do? He's got more money than the king of heaven, Indra, and he's got a wife that's an angel. If these ropes don't tie him, what will ordinary robes do? <laughs> so, uh, so Raghunath das, das Goswami finally left his home and then he joined Lord Chaitanya. In, uh, and of course his austerities were really, really strong. And he is, um, he is Rati Manjari in the spiritual world. He is a, a personal assistant of Srimati Radharani. He takes care of Radharani directly. He does personal service for Srimati Radharani in his, in his Siddha Deva, in his spiritual body in the spiritual world. So he's a very powerful personality in Lord Chaitanya's entourage. And uh, he wrote one beautiful book. It's called Vilapa Kusamanjali. And I think His Holiness Shiva Ram Maharaj has made a book out of that and published it, and you can read those verses. I think Maharaj also gives explanations on some of the verses. So that's a beautiful, that's, that's Raghunath Das Goswami's service to Srimati Radharani. He writes it in these, these 
beautiful, beautiful verses. <clears throat> and last but not least is Vishwanath Chakravarti Thakur. Uh, of course, he's more contemporary, and we know him to be a great author. He has written Sarathi Darshani, Sarar Sararatha Darshani, a complete commentary on the entire Srimad Bhagavatam. And uh, he's written many other books also. Um, he, he lived in Vrindavan, stayed practically in Vrindavan his whole life, mostly writing books and doing worship there. One story we know is that at one time, the devotees who are followers of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu were in, uh, in uh, what is that place? Mm -hmm. I'm not good with names. Uh, where were all the deities were hidden when they after a Ramzag attacked? Jaipur, yeah, Jaipur, Jaipur. So there was a group of Vaishnavas called the Ramanandis. They were breakoffs from the Sri Sampradaya, and they uh, they challenged that the uh, Gaudiya Vaishnavas they don't have a commentary on the Vedanta Sutra, and therefore they're not authorized. Because if you're a part of a sampradaya, you have to have a commentary on the Vedanta Sutra, otherwise you are not authorized sampradaya. So, of course. Prabhupada said it, Acharya say it, our commentary on Vedanta Sutra is Srimad Bhagavatam. But they didn't accept that. They say, no, you, ha you have to have a written commentary on Vedanta Sutra. So the only one who could do it at that time was Vishwanath Chakravarti Thakur. But he was quite elderly, and his health was not good. He was in Vrindavan. So he couldn't travel. So, but he decided, and he used his influence to contact Baladeva Vidyabhushan to do the commentary. So Baladeva accepted it, but he felt like he wasn't qualified. But he decided, well, Vishwanath, Vishwanath is asking me, asking me to do this. And our whole sampradaya is at stake, our reputation, if we don't have it. So he said, let me try. But before he tried, he went to the Govindaji temple in Jaipur. If you've been to Jaipur, and how many of you have been to Jaipur? Anybody? No? You've been to Jaipur? Did you go to Govindaji temple there? Yeah, that temple is amazing. You can go there, Mangalarti, every day. Deities are available, they have a wonderful darshan, and they do the Mangalarti. And the place fills up with thousands of people. They come for that particular Mangalarti. The original Govindaji temple installed by, the Radha Govindaji installed by Rupa Goswami, and later moved to Jaipur in order to prevent them from being attacked by Aranzeb. So he went to Govindaji, and he put his head at the feet of Govindaji, praying to Govindaji, please empower me to do this work. At that point, when he was praying, the garland from Govindaji's uh, neck fell off and landed right on, on Baladev. And then that was confirmation. There were many other devotees there, and they all cheered. Yeah, Govindaji has given his permission has given his blessings. And so, because of that, Baladev wrote that commentary, and which was called Govinda Basya. Basya means spoken by. So, spoken by Govinda, the commentary. And then, of course, see this whole thing centered around the king of Jayapur, who was um, Govinda Singh, I think his name was at the time. And he was a Vaishnava, and he wanted to protect the movement. But because the Ramanandis were so strong, and they were challenging, 
So he was in favor of it. Yes, we need to have a commentary. So Baladev did it. And then once that was done, the king was happy and the Ramanandis were quiet. <laughs> they couldn't find any fault. But our real commentary on the uh, Vedanta Sutra is Srimad Bhagavatam, which was penned by you know, Vyasadeva himself. So that's a little bit, and of course there's a lot more on uh, Vishwanath Chakravarti Thakur. He's written many books, but um, if you're reading Srimad Bhagavatam, and you should be, <laughs> you can always supplement your reading with the commentaries of Vishwanath Chakravarti. You read the text, you read Prabhupada's purport, and you can read what Vishwanath says. And he gives a lot of extra information in regards to the text and to the purports also. And very large commentaries on some of the verses, and sometimes he doesn't comment on any verse, but it's interesting what he writes many times. Um, it's like really little jewels of spiritual information that you won't find anywhere like that. Okay, so these are the personalities that are honored on today. Vishant Panchmi. Today is the first day of spring, a very auspicious day. Um, today for uh, making a vow. <laughs> Uh, how to increase our devotional service. <laughs> more and more, I think. Jai Sri Panchatattva Ki Jai. Sri Sri Gornatai Ki Jai. So we have many opportunities to, as an excuse, to increase our devotional service. If we are not increasing our devotional service, we are decreasing our devotional service. There's no such thing as staying in one place. You're either going forward or you're going backward. So a devotee knows that I should always be trying to do better service with what the service I'm doing and more service if I can do more also. Increasing the quality of our service, especially our chanting and understanding our philosophy and developing relationships with other Vaishnavas and trying to think, what other service can I do? Especially if those of you who like to cook, cooks can always think, oh, what else can I cook? There's so many things to cook. I'm only cooking a few, but look, there's thousands and thousands of recipes available. And if you're a singer, you can always add more bhajans if you do vastu, you can always go deeper. <laughs> you can be vastu acharya, <laughs> giving lessons to the other vastu leaders. <laughs> so we can always think, how can we improve our service? How can we improve our quality? How can we do more? This is, the, this is a, a feature of our movement. And Prabhupada was like that. He was always trying to inspire the devotees to expand the movement more by doing more and more and more. Sometimes we think, boy, I'm doing too much, I should do less. <laughs> but that's not our mood. Our mood is to think, what else can I do or how can I improve whatever I'm doing? And especially, we should be thinking how to improve our japa. That's the thing that we really want to focus on because when you, when you improve your japa, you pr improve everything else about your, your spiritual practice. Because japa is the basis of our spiritual advancement. Okay, so we're right at the mark. Questions? Comments? Okay. Mm 
Maharaj, I'm wondering, as you mentioned this um, extraordinary personality who found, uh, who was a mystic at the end. Oh, uh, Abhiram Saka? Yes. Yeah, he was really powerful. Can you explain this? How can a, a devotee be powerful? How does this work? Is he powerful where's, because of empowerment? Or? Where's it? When, uh, when Prahlad Maharaj was being harassed by his father, trying to, his father tried to kill him in so many ways. You know, he tried to poison him, throw him off a mountain, throw him under the elephant's feet, threw him in the ocean, put spells, he tried, tried everything to kill him. And at one point later, Rani Kashi Poo said to Prahlad, where do you get your power from? <laughs> and uh, Prahlad said, my dear father, I get my power from the same place you get your power, from the same place everybody gets their power, <laughs> from Krishna, <laughs> from Vishnu. So a devotee, the more they surrender, the more they become powerful. And that's why this movement is so powerful. If we surrender more and more, it's, it's easy to spread Krishna consciousness because it's, the powerment comes from the source. Chaitanya Mahaprabhu is Krishna himself and he is the source of empowerment. He can empower his devotees to do amazing things. Things that you would think that would be impossible to do become easy. It says that. When one, when one is empowered by Lord Chaitanya, then the difficult things become so easy. So that's our movement. What, in and of ourselves, what can we do? We are small. But if you can, just like if um, the story of Dhruva Maharaj, Dhruva Maharaj performed such great austerities that he was so powerful that because he wasn't breathing, the entire universal breath was being disturbed. It was only when the demigods complained to Lord Vishnu that Vishnu came to see Dhruva. But Dhruva was so powerful that and Prabhupada gives an example of how it, how it goes. He says, you're in an airplane, and the airplane's going 700 miles an hour. Are you going 700 miles an hour? Yes, because you're connected with the airplane. So when you're connected with something powerful, you become powerful. <laughs> so when you're connected with Krishna, the more you connect with Krishna, Power is one of his opulences. He has so many opulence, that's one of them. Devotees can do amazing things. And the fact that our movement has spread around the world so fast is because the devotees have been empowered by the Lord to do amazing things. Just like book distribution. I mean, people who are in the secular world, they come up to our book distributors and say, you know, you know, you guys sell books really good. Uh, you know, here's my card. If you need a job, I, I can, uh, you know. That's happened. Because I'm a salesman, and I can see you have sales. At, but we don't have any sales ability. I mean, there was one devotee in, in, in Bombay. I know her very good. She's a, a female, Mataji. She, she, she distributed 12,000 Bhagavad Gita's in one day. One day. <laughs> 12,000. She went into a factory, got the head of the factory to agree, and he took 12,000 Bhagavad Gita's for every one of his employees. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, you know. If you're empowered, you can do amazing things. But you always have to remember it's not you. It's Krishna. And Krishna, he can empower you. 
and he can take everything away. He can take everything away from you that you don't even know your own name. What's your name? Uh, I don't know. <laughs> I mean, you can go down to that level where you don't know anything. And Krishna will show you sometimes that, oh, if you think you're so empowered, you think you're so great, he takes it away and then you realize, what happened? <laughs> but then, as soon as you surrender, then he gives it back again. No, it's Krishna. So that's why you should never feel like you're self-limited by your own situation. You can judge yourself and you say, oh, I can't do this, I'm not able to do this. That means you don't understand this movement. That means you don't understand this movement. Because everything is empowered by Krishna through the spiritual master. If you're connected to someone powerful, you become powerful. So there's no limit. So Abhiram Saka, I mean, he's an internal associate of Krishna and Vrindavan. One time he went to, into the woods, and he's a cowherd boy. And cowherd boys sometimes play flutes. So he picked up a tree, a big tree, and he held it like a flute. He's holding a tree like this, and he stood like that for nine hours without moving in this position, holding this big tree like a flute, nine hours. Let's mention Chaitanya Bhagavan. So yeah, these are some of the associates of Lord Chaitanya. Uh, so we're not amazed to think you see like that. We're because we know that, you know, Mukan Karoti Vachalam Pangu lagate girin, yat kripa taraham bande, sigurun dina tarinam. That by the mercy of the Lord, a dumb man can recite beautiful poetry, a lame man can walk across mountains, a blind man can see the stars. <laughs> So with the mercy of the Lord, that's why devotees should never feel, oh, well, I can't do this, I can't do that. Some things you're not meant to do, and because you're not meant to do those things, you won't be able to do them. But then again, you should see what are you meant to do, and then try to expand your service in those areas like that. And then you'll find that you can do wonderful things. And we see all over the movement many miraculous things happen. <laughs> and here you had your miracles too, right? <laughs> so many miracles here. We see them every day. Sometimes they look like small miracles, but then there's some bigger ones. That's why when Lord, when, when Lord Chaitanya said this movement will take over the world, he wasn't just saying that, because he knows that at one time the devotees will be ready to receive his empowerment. And Prabhupada told us that. Prabhupada said, we could take over the whole world in 18 days, but you are not ready. In other words, he was telling us, you know, it's not difficult to take over the world, but we have to be ready. And what is that readiness? Full surrender. So then, then again, you might have to understand, well, what is it? What do I mean to surrender more? So that's the process. Look and see what, what attachments you have and see how you can get rid of those attachments and see where you can where you where you can make a difference in your service and then make that more and more you know perfect 
But never become a defeatist. Oh, I can't do this, 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 this. We get into this. This is all material. As Prabhupada said, uh, what's the word? He said, um, in a fool's dictionary, what is it? Impossible is a word in a fool's dictionary. <laughs> Impossible is a word in a fool's dictionary. When Prabhupada went to Los Angeles in 1975, he had completed his Chaitanya Charitamrita. And none, only one book was actually published. There was 17 volumes at the time. So Prabhupada came to Los Angeles and said, and that was the headquarters of the movement at the time. Everything was there. The BBT was there. The art department was there. Everything was there. So Prabhupada said, I have finished all the books and I want you to print the entire Chaitanya Charitamrita in one month. <laughs> now, the devotees had been doing one volume every two months. Now Prabhupada is asking for 17 volumes in one month. So Ramashwar, Ramashwar and Radha Balaba were the leaders of the temple at the time. So they told Prabhupada, Prabhupada, that's impossible. We're doing one book every two months, and you want us to do 17 books in uh, one month? Prabhupada said, impossible is a word in a fool's dictionary. And Prabhupada wasn't going to change his mind. So then there was a discussion among the leading devotees that Prabhupada's serious. He really wants this. So what can we do? We can't say no to Prabhupada. So they said, all right, we'll have to make a deal with Prabhupada. <laughs> <laughs> so they said, Srila Prabhupada, we'll do it, but we want you to stay here for that one month. <laughs> Prabhupada said, I will stay. So Prabhupada agreed to stay. So they put the whole temple, which was about 150 devotees at the time, on a 24-hour work cycle. In other words, everybody worked 24 hours around the clock. And they were, you know, they were transcribing, they were printing, they were binding, they were publishing, they were editing, they were putting everything together in these books. And they were, the artists were painting the paintings, the artists were sleeping where they were painting, and they would fall asleep there. They would wake up. People would bring their prasadam. They never left. For, 20, for one full month, that entire temple was on 24-hour work shift. Didn't stop. And at the end of the one month, they completed the whole 17 volumes. Prabhupada was really happy. And the quality? If you see those volumes that were first published, ideal quality. Prabhupada, everything was done so expertly. And uh, Prabhupada was so happy. So Prabhupada got all his, everything done in one month. And Prabhupada was like that. He would push us. Because he knew, if you surrender to Krishna, Krishna will empower you. So that same Prabhupada is here today telling us, you know, come on. <laughs> You can do more. You can do better. <laughs> I was listening to Prabhupada the other day. He says, when you get old, generally you get, you get, you know, you need more rest. You know, you have to slow down. But he said, that's not for the devotee. <laughs> he says, as you get older, you do more. <laughs> and Prabhupada was an example of that. <laughs> And when he was like, you know, approaching 80 years old, he was still traveling around the world. <laughs> so don't limit, your, limit to yourself and to, to what you think is your limitations. You can always do better, you can always do more. And when you have that mood and you work towards that mood, you'll see wonderful things happen. Krishna will 
own power. It's, it's coming from Krishna. There's no other source of power other than Krishna himself. And he likes to empower his devotees, but he'll only do it if we are ready to receive his empowerment. Right, so what's coming up? What's the next holiday? Is Advaita Acharya's appearance day? So you can cook, you know, 108 preparations that day. Huh? Who will eat it? We'll just we'll put out the word and people will come. <laughs> the devotee, the congregation will be lining up outside. <laughs> So you know what I'm just using that as a way to say don't be don't limit yourself try to understand it it's not us you know it's krishna krishna is in, krishna is in control of this movement but he only gives according to how we surrender But we have to develop the proper consciousness, too. It's not just about doing more work. It's not just about doing more better work. It's about developing the proper consciousness. And that is the consciousness of devotion. That we offer everything we do as a service to the Lord in order to please the Lord and to serve the, the devotees. That's the mood. <laughs> Enthusiasm. Okay, I think our question asked or he disappeared. Maybe he went out to get some empowerment. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Is there anyone else would like to say anything? Hare Krishna. Very short question. So Mahaprabhu, he was married twice, is it? First wife was Lakshmi Priya uh, and then Vishnu Priya. So who were they in the Krishna Lila? Mm. Vishnu Priya is called, she's called the Bhu energy. Krishna has three principal energies called Bhu Shakti, Kriya Shakti, and Leela Shakti. She's Bhu Shakti. It's a particular energy of the Lord for the Lord's pastimes. So she's not, she doesn't appear in all the Leelas, but she appeared in Lord Chaitanya's Leela. She's actually the goddess of fortune in a particular manifestation of herself. Because <laughs> You know, God can't be more married to an ordinary lady, you know. <laughs> she's, she's a highly empowered, and she's actually, you know, the part of the internal energy of the Lord. And Lakshmi Priya is? Lakshmi Priya was also from that same energy, but she was in a different category. We don't know so much about Lakshmi Priya because the marriage was so short, and there's not much there's not much written about that relationship except that when Lord Chaitanya right after he got married he went to Bangladesh to preach and while he was there uh, Lakshmi Priya died she was feeling separation and she died out of separation so that's all we know and then of course there's a few little bit of a mention about their marriage but that's all Thank you. Okay, thank you. So we'll stop here. Thank you very much. Shri Vasan Panchami Ki Jai, Samaveda Bhakta Vinda Ki Jai, Gaur Pimanande. Hare Krishna.